Welcome back to Goldmark TV. Ahead of our uh, fantastic scheduled uh, chat between the Reverend Richard Coles and Phil Rogers on Monday, uh, this is our live walkthrough uh, Phil Rogers exhibition here at the gallery. I'm really excited to show you some of the, the pots that we've got upstairs. It's really looking really beautiful. Vicky's done a, a fantastic job of, of setting it out. Um, there's lots of really interesting and beautiful things to talk about. I thought we'd start down here uh, with these slowly emerging granomia of my shoulder. Uh, these sets of 80 granomia have become a, a real uh, sort of um, staple in, in what, what Phil does for, for the, the gallery. Um, they're a remarkable labour of love, over nine or twelve months of, of effort, three different firings in three different kilns to produce these fantastic pots. As you'll see in the variety that we've got appearing here, uh, this describes the essence of what Phil's pottery is like, that the, the sheer uh, range that he's working in and the way that he's always trying to push himself and find new forms, new surfaces and new textures in the work that he makes. Let's go and have a look at the pots upstairs and see how some of the, the beautiful glazes and decoration that we can see on these granomi have been used on these other pots. Welcome to our Phil Rogers exhibition. I think the pots are looking really fantastic up here. This is by far not the first time we've shown Phil's work. Uh, our history with him goes right the way back to 2005. He was one of the first potters that we showed here at the gallery. So this is a, a 15 year working relationship that you're seeing uh, unfolding here. Phil's history with ceramics though goes uh, a lot further back. Uh, back in the early 1970s, he was teaching himself how to throw from uh, Bernard Leach's uh, book, um, looking at pots from the past uh, as his sort of his cipher, his way into this world of, of ceramics. So really what we're seeing today is not just the culmination of, a, of an extraordinary career in, in, in pottery, um, but also someone who has forged his own path and uh, who's uh, sense of, of adventure and, and, and challenge and development and progress has, has never ceased. He's always tried to push beyond what he can do, uh, push the bounds of, his, uh, of, of what he does and the traditions that he's rooted in. Um, so that's what we're going to see here today. One of the things that really stands out for me when you look at Phil's work is that for someone who's working in such a breadth, such a range of different glazes, uh, shapes uh, and, and decorative styles, that all of his work has retained a, a really individual flavour. You can tell almost immediately when you see a Phil Rogers pot that it's his. Um, and that's something that I think comes from that, the, those many years of working towards uh, developing his own voice, but, but having been self-taught too, having defined his own way, that kind of pressure has meant that um, a lots of the, the experiments, the, the failures as much as the successes, have built into a, a really unique voice in British pottery, despite the, the many traditions that it's rooted in and, the, and the, uh, the different past makers that it's drawing upon. So what we're going to see in this exhibition are a number of different styles and, and, and glazes. So if you have a look over here, we've got a, um, some three, I think, different types of ash glaze on this, on this pot. Tomoku glazes, these beautiful bunchong pots here. Part of the reason for Phil's success in tackling all these different aspects of pottery is that he's never been afraid of, of, uh, of challenging himself, but also of, of enduring the, the um, the, the difficulties of working towards something new, working in new arenas. So if you look at these three bottles here, uh, 
we can see we've uh, we've had the the hackame work, the punch on work, which is filled uh, fired in uh, Phil's oil kiln. Here we've got a beautiful salt glaze pot from a salt kiln with this ash glaze on it. It's giving this lovely texture. And then pots that have been fired in the wood wood firing kiln. That's three different kilns. It's three very different ways of working that Phil has, uh, has had to work towards over the years. The wood firing kiln, I think, was built in 2008. So that's been a nearly, a, a nearly sort of 12, 13 years of, of development, um, of, of painstaking, uh, working towards the um, understanding the behaviours of that kiln. It's a two-chamber kiln, I think. Um, and I know that three or four years ago, he was writing about how he might be coming to the end of his wood firing career. Um, it's an incredibly labour intensive way of working. Tons of, tens of tons of wood that has to be uh, chopped and stacked. Uh, there's the firing itself, which is long, protracted, uh, and often unpredictable. Um, I think he said in the past that a wood firing kiln can, can kick you in the teeth for no apparent reason. Uh, and in the past, he's had to smash as many pots as he's kept. Um, I'm delighted to see that since those three years, he's, uh, he's kept at it and there, there are some really beautiful wood fire pots that we're going to be having a look at today. Phil has been based in uh, Rayada in Wales, uh, mid Wales, for a, a time now. Um, if you look at the, the tradition, the, the, the pottery tradition that, that many people ascribe to him, this sort of Anglo Oriental school, um, one that people trace back to, to Bernard Leach and Hamada, and the pots that they were looking at, the Korean pots, the the German salt glaze pots, the Staffordshire uh, slipware. Often Phil is sort of bundled up with that tradition, with that Anglo-Oriental tradition. I think he's grown a voice that's quite distinct within that area. In fact, that sort of has left it behind, really. He's working within his own influences now. Being based in, in Reda, in this beautiful countryside, uh, across the mountains towards Aberystwyth and, and down abutting his, his, uh, his workshop, his garden, is the River Wye that flows uh, through this landscape. I think you get a real reflection of uh, the Welsh countryside around him, of these beautiful lush greens, uh, of the different shapes, the changing of the seasons. You can see that in some of these pots, especially, I think, the ash glazes that Phil uh, has become a bit of an expert in over the years. He's written books on, on ash glazing and salt glazing, and ash glazes have remained a, have remained a fascination for him. I think if you, if you look into some of these pots, these, the, the beautiful shapes and the curves, something like these bits of finger decoration across a bottle like this, you can feel the movement of the river, those contours of the landscape of the valleys around him. There's a very distinct voice here, despite all those many influences having fed into it in those early years. Um, and what we're seeing is a is a potter who has, who has really found his, his own, carved his own, his own uh, niche within, within that world. So one of the types of pottery that we'll see in this exhibition, this beautiful bunchong pottery, which you can see in these benches and shelves around me, um, really shows you how Phil has, has, uh, has taken to challenges and has worked uh, to find his own voice within those, those, uh, those traditions, those, those sort of... Uh, uh, the genres. It's a style that originates in Korea in the Joseon dynasty. That's around uh, sort of the 15th, 16th century. Uh, it was for around 200 years that it was sort of slowly developed. Bunchong pottery is really uh, very simple. It's down to three different elements. There was a dark clay, a clear glaze and a white slip that was brushed over the, the surface of the pot. And I think it's thought by, by some people that maybe this was um, at, at a time when uh, there was a sort of growing interest in, in porcelain, a growing uh, desire and demand for porcelain, um, that this was a way for the Korean potters, whose clays were naturally dark, naturally rich in iron, for them to, to get some sort of, uh, get a, a white surface across them. I know that Phil's been working on his bunch on for a number of years and that he's now at a point where he's happy with it. Um, but it's, a, it's a, a style that goes right back into his history. Um, his, his wife is Korean, but also um, in the late 90s, he spent some time working in Korea. And there's a particular style of bunchung pottery, 
uh, that's tied to uh, uh, the mountain ranges there, um, which includes this iron brushwork, this very fluid, loose uh, uh, brushwork. And for a number of years, he worked in Korea and had these mountains right there out of his window, uh, the Goryeonsan uh, mountain range. Um, and so this is really a style that's been, that's been sort of, uh, you know, 20 years in the, in the, in the development, in, 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 the, in the thinking. I think it really enlivens uh, certain, certain forms. The, the, the brushing with a very sort of thick brush and these very sort of loose strokes so that you get some of that dark clay coming, coming up, I think it really suits uh, these sort of, um, some of these rounder forms, things like these bowls, these sets of bowls where the movement of the brush echoes the form itself. But I think where it really stands out are, uh, is on these uh, press moulded bottles. These fillers worked on for a number of years and they give them a beautiful blank canvas. They're very sort of sculptural in, in feel, but they give these, these lovely um, flat surfaces for him to, to decorate over. And he's worked very hard to um, develop a, a brush style that um, isn't derivative. It doesn't, doesn't uh, simply echo what was done in the past in, in Korea or by potters like Hamader who were looking at those traditions and, and, and uh, um, sort of uh, revitalizing them. There's some lovely examples down here, but I think my favorite is probably this beautiful sort of square shaped, uh, uh, squ square uh, formed bottle here. And I love that the slip is really nice and thick. So you almost get this sort of uniform wave up here and then this beautiful, very brave, bare shoulder that goes around the pot. And I think the brushwork here is really beautiful. This lovely, very slight stem or, 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 or branch here with these lovely leaves coming off it. It feels like, like proper calligraphy. And I know that it's difficult to get that, to achieve that with this, this iron pigment. It doesn't, doesn't behave just like, like an ink would uh, on, on, on paper or on canvas. Um, so to get that, that freedom, um, that sense of looseness is, is, is really remarkable. I think this is one of my favorite parts in the exhibition. And you can see that's been achieved on all of the faces of this bottle. This lovely upward motion that sort of breaks the monotony of the straight lines on this, on this, this square form. It's a lovely example of how to, to unify decoration and form and how to take a very old way of making parts, a very old way of decorating parts and make it feel completely modern and, and completely new and completely of Phil's work. You'll see some more of that, that sort of brushwork on some of these wax resist pots that we've got around here. Um, so different colour scheme, uh, a different uh, method, but with the same fluidity. And then when we come to these pots over here, this little selection here gives you a real feel for the decorative range that Phil has. One of the things that Phil has always been wary of is how to make sure that his decoration is always serving the glazes, serving the forms that he's using. Um, you can see a huge range of different techniques here uh, in these, these pots that share a very uh, similar voice. Uh, we've got some paddling. I know that Phil has made some of his own paddles uh, with different designs on them. They give these lovely sort of raised edges that allow glaze to catch or break over. We've got sort of scratching through with combs. Uh, you can see that on these, these lines here, but also it's been uh, applied to these, sort of little, these little pellets, these little uh, shoulders. Uh, finger wiping, incision, uh, using pellets to, to add uh, little sort of decorative motifs to the clay that allow glaze to, to hang or, or, or drip around uh, the pot. Here's a lovely Tomoku Chawan, and you can see uh, on this on this this bowl um, one of the, the the recurring motifs that Phil likes to use. He likes to to apply these bands to the middle of the pots. And where the pot itself has a kind of uniformity in its roundness, in the in the rhythm of the of the, the from from the sort of the hip of the bowl up to the rim, these bands he he, he enlivens by by um, taking a rib or, or or a similar tool and making sure that they wave, that they don't have a sort of um, they don't have a, a have a constancy, a, a constant motion around the pot, that they have a bit of rhythm. 
you can see here what that's done with this beautiful tomoku is it's given it all these lovely sort of breaking points here where the, this deep rich black has broken to this beautiful sort of russet colour that you get with tomoku. And then in here, a nuka glaze for the, for the interior and around the edge that's churned ever so slightly so you get this sort of beautiful blue effect as it, as it sort of merges with the, with the tomoku. It's a really very simple bowl when you break it down into its, into its component parts. But it gives you an idea of how decoration, glazing, throwing, everything is unified in, in Phil's, Phil's pottery. He's always thinking um, from the form on the wheel right the way through to the, to the final product, what, it, what it's going to, um, what, it's going to, what different techniques and, and glazes it's going to combine to best effect. Phil is a potter who has tried as best he can to use local materials um, to embrace what is around him in making his pots. Uh, now, like all potters, he's limited in where he is in, in, in his environment uh, to the different materials that he can, he can source. Um, I know that there are local stone quarries where he can get some materials uh, and a beautiful dark, coarse red clay uh, that he can find in the woodlands around where he lives, which doesn't make a very good clay body, but it's great for, for, for slips. One of the things that really stands out in Phil's work is his approach to, to ash glazing. It's something that he's written books on, that he's, he's been studying for, for years throughout his career. And it's something that, that he has um, applied that knowledge to, uh, to, to beautiful effect. There's a number of different ash glazes throughout this, um, throughout this exhibition. In particular, this lovely rich pine glaze that you'll see, which is this lovely sort of sage-like colour. Um, you'll see that recurring a number of times. But there's one that I'd like to point out in particular, and that's because it's, it's rather special. That's this lovely elm ash glaze that you can see in this dish here. And it almost goes to a sort of bluish colour. There's a slight sort of blue tint to it. It's very cool compared to the, the warmer pine that you can sort of see around this edge. Now, as many of you will know, um, there, are, there are no elms really around it, 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 in this country, um, thanks to elm disease. Um, the, the tree species is, is, has died off, so elm ash is not something that's, that's out there that you can source. The elm ash glazes that you see on Phil's pots come from a, um, a store that a, a, a fellow potter, I think, had kept for, for nearly 30, 35, 40 years um, before uh, giving it to Phil. Um, so this is, this is a really sort of um, beautiful, uh, touching, uh, hearkening back to that time when, when elm trees were much more readily available. And despite that, that scarcity, uh, Phil's used it to, to, to really beautiful effect on a number of the pots around here. We'll have a look at some of those in just a second. Phil's Tamuku pots, that's this lovely black glaze that we can see here, are some of my favourite in this exhibition. I know it's a real shame that, that we can't have people here to, to pick up and handle the pots. That's part of what these, these shows and, and what um, selling pots for us has always meant. It's meant that sort of tactile engagement with, with the work. Um, but I'm hoping that this is sort of bringing them somewhat closer to you at home. Here's one of my favourite pots in the exhibition. That's this beautiful round belly jug. It's quite a different jug form to, to many of the, the, the jugs that I've seen uh, Phil, Phil make in the past. Um, he's sort of well known for, for his ability to make these, um, these beautiful uh, baluster and medieval style jugs. Um, they've become a real sort of uh, staple of his, of his repertoire. I love the generousness in this, this pot. I love how, how big and round this, this lovely belly is with this this sort of um, impressed, this, this rope decoration that's, that's been applied here. Very simple. When you're throwing a jug, a lot of the movements, uh, a lot of the, the, sh the forms when you're making a jug around the, the lip area, around this sort of beak area, have to be quite exaggerated when you're throwing. Uh, 
as the clay dries, it sort of tends to, to loosen and, and, and lose some of that, that, that shape. Um, so to get this beautiful, very exaggerated thin neck here, and this lovely curved beak with this ash glaze that's pulled beautifully around it, that's a real testament to his skill, to, to, to his knowledge, to years of making jugs like this, that he's been able to maintain that, that very sort of delicate top to this very generous body. You'll see in this exhibition a real range of ash glazes on, on these pots. So we've got a number here and across the room on this bench over here. Phil has really masterfully blended them together, um, been able to use different uh, ash glazes on top of one another in, in combination um, to really beautiful effect. Part of what makes his use of ash glaze really, um, really successful is his understanding of how they behave, um, of how that runniness that an ash glaze often has um, is, is to be exploited. On the barest patches of a pot, you get the sort of the purest colour in, in, in an ash glaze, that sort of that beautiful translucency, the jewel-like quality um, that you can see, uh, maybe it's say on, on these sort of shoulders here, these beautiful woody greens and sages and olives. And ash glaze has this other beautiful property where uh, it needs spaces to pool in or to, or to catch on to, to, to um, to, to rest in, and that gives you the full depth of the colour, that really dark quality. You'll see that in something like this, this beautiful dish with this impressed chrysanthemum design and these combs. Because of the, the shape of this bowl, the glaze has been able to run down and you get this wonderful pool across the bottom here. In fact, it's pulled so deeply here that you can't actually feel this comb decoration. It's completely filled these trenches. You can see these wonderful colours, these blues, these dark sort of ambers and jades and greens and sort of bottle colours. Completely different from this, these sort of warmer tones up here. And that's all enlivened with these little nuka pores up here. Something like that is in complete contrast to these pots up here in uh, the sort of shigaraki style clay. This is another example of how Phil has taken to experiment. Uh, shigaraki clays in Japan uh, are often unglazed. Um, it's part of their natural clay body, uh, the, the chemical makeup of the clay body, that gives them this wonderful blushing orange colour. The materials in Japan, the clay bodies, uh, their, their chemical makeup, that's going to differ very, very much from, from what Phil has uh, to hand in, in Wales. So he spent time analysing those clays and, and sort of reconstituting his own, his own formula um, based on, 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 on those that he'd seen in Japan uh, and some help from, from other potters. Um, it has this wonderful textural quality, this, this, this clay, these little... Um, sort of granules of, of, of feldspar and quartz that, that push through the clay during the firing and that's why you get these sort of lovely white ball-like surfaces appearing in the, in, in, in the surface. It's an example of really knowing your materials, knowing how they're going to behave within certain, certain environments. These shigaraki clays really, um, they, they uh, blossom in, in the fire kiln, they get these wonderful uh, blushing colours. Uh, if you have a look on something like this jar, you can see the breadth of the, the range of, of red, deep red colours in this clay here. This wonderful rough texture that's then lightened by this pooling ash glaze here. And it contrasts beautifully with the ash glaze on top. This is again, I think, that pine ash glaze that we've seen throughout, which gives you this lovely olive colour.
even though the work here is so observably Phil's, it's so much, uh, so distinctly his character, there are a number of different things that in this exhibition that I've not seen in his work before. Um, different shapes, different glaze combinations. There's one in particular, there's a beautiful new bottle design that I've not seen him make before. Again, another of these, these bunk chong pots. This one with this lovely broad bottom that sort of tapers to this neck at the top. And that gives another, uh, another surface that, that encourages that motion of the brush, that sort of curvature of the, of the slip being applied. The bunk chong style, uh, because it has these layers, this layer of, of slip and, and, and brushwork, and because the slip is so versatile, it lends itself to so many different forms, to different uh, variations, different styles, um, different sort of invigorations of, 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 of tradition. And really that gets to the essence of what, what Phil's pottery is about. It's about taking the very, um, very basic, the very traditional, the very old uh, and established ways of doing things, um, the established materials, and finding ways of making them feel new and feel fresh and feel alive. That's what I think he's done in this, in this exhibition. And it's no mean feat across such a huge number of pots. Um, I've really enjoyed walking around here, looking at them with you. Um, it seems fitting actually to be ending with um, a, a vase like this, um, where all of that has come together. This beautiful elm ash glaze at the top, the pine ash, these nuka pores, the inside decoration, this combing, a huge amount of work, a huge amount of, of variety that's been unified in a single pot. That's really what Phil Rogers pottery is about and that's what uh, this exhibition has embodied. I hope you've enjoyed looking around today. Um, I'm sure there'll be more illuminations tomorrow when, when the Reverend Richard Coles talks to Phil about some of the work, uh, about his, his philosophy of making, what the pots mean to him. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing that, so I, I hope you are too. Um, so stay tuned with us at, at 4pm tomorrow for that. Uh, I hope to see you again soon and, and explore some more of the wonderful parts in this exhibition. educate, entertain our customers. Okay, so now we're going to look at some other of his prints. We're thinking very seriously about stopping making pots. There was nothing forced. And I think his jugs are, are really the epitome of that. Hello, welcome to today's broadcast from the Goldmark Gallery. One of my most regular places to visit up in this part of the world is the Goldmark Gallery. Mm -hmm.